Thank you, Mike. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I have a very short period of time to cover a very broad, complex topic. And this is a test of how well I can gloss over this complex topic and hopefully impart a few nuggets of uh, information. Um, let me begin by talking uh, about the history of device lit litigation, medical device litigation in Michigan. Uh, but first I'll advise you that contrary to popular belief, device litigation is not dead in Michigan. And in fact, um, it is getting healthier and I will explain why that is in a moment. First, the history. Uh, once upon a time, uh, the landscape and the environment for device litigation was very different. Um, there was a time when there was no uh, Medical Device uh, Act. In 1976, the first uh, Medical Device Act was passed. But before that, there was no preemption. And after the act was passed in 76, most devices were actually grandfathered in and therefore there was no FDA approval process. Um, my experience with medical devices dates back to the Delcon Shield days. Uh, that was a product that was uh, marketed beginning in 1970 and shortly thereafter uh, thousands of women experienced um, horrible life-threatening pelvic infections and what followed after that were thousands of lawsuits filed all over the country against the A.H. Robbins Company. Uh, my partner at the time, Bill Gage, uh, happened to have one of those cases. There was a verdict in Colorado of about $6 million. There was an AP writer who wanted to do a story on uh, the Delcon Shield, and so she came to Detroit. Um, she was young, attractive. She met with Bill Gage. They did it off very well. And she ended up writing a very glowing article about him and the A.H. Robbins litigation, the Delcon Shield litigation. The story got picked up by a number of papers all over the country, and then calls started flowing into our office where we had three attorneys at the time. Uh, we ended up with uh, 40 to 50 cases. Remember, this is back in the days when there were no computers, there was no uh, uh, sophisticated copiers. I think we were using um, carbon copies. So we had rooms and rooms filled with documents and pleadings. And it required us to develop systems uh, to keep track of all of the cases and the clients and where the cases stood in litigation. And uh, this indeed was a very good training ground for me with respect to medical device litigation. Um, back then, we had no uh, silly product liability statute, and consequently, there were no caps. And uh, there were a number of sizable verdicts and settlements, uh, especially with the Delcon Shield, until that day when A.H. Robbins filed bankruptcy, and then we had to deal with the uh, trustees. Uh, of a, a bankruptcy fund that was established. I believe uh, Marty Robinson was a, a trustee for that fund as well. Um, after uh, the uh, Delcon Shield litigation, uh, there were a number of uh, medical devices uh, that um, ended up in uh, multi-district litigation matters. Um, as you may know, a multi-district litigation um, is a process where the federal courts consolidate cases that have been filed around the country into a single district for purposes of being managed uh, during the pre-suit phase. So all of the discovery is coordinated. And then if there is a resolution uh, to the case, a schedule is issued and cases can be resolved according to the schedule. If there is no resolution, then the case will be remanded back to the uh, venue of origin for trial. Um, so what is the landscape like today? Uh, now we do have federal preemption if the device is um, FDA approved, meaning if the device goes through the rigorous process of submitting uh, case controlled studies for evaluation, uh, if the FDA has determined that these studies reveal safety and efficacy and approve the drug, then there is a preemption clause in the FDA um, statute or the medical device 
uh, statute that preempts any state law requirements that are different from or add to the requirements uh, of the FDA. And case law has uh, uh, ruled that any common law tort action adds to or is different from the requirements of the FDA and hence any case based upon a state law cause of action uh, is preempted. There is a huge exception, however, and that's if the device receives what's called 510K approval. 510K approval is a fast track to getting a device approved and marketed if the manufacturer can establish that a device uh, that it wants to market is substantially similar to a device that is already on the market, then that device will receive what's called 510K approval. And the beauty of that is, um, from a litigation standpoint, is there's no preemption. And the fact of the matter is, is that most medical devices that are on the market today have received their approval from the FDA through this 510K process. In 19, um, I'm sorry, in 2009, there were something like 1,400 devices that were approved through the 510K process, and only about 40 or 50 devices actually went through the traditional um, FDA approval. Um, some good news, uh, the Michigan Drug Immunity Statute does not apply to medical devices. So we have this huge disparity, um, or paradox, I guess you could call it, um, in the area of drugs and devices where we have a federal law that provides preemption for devices that have been approved. Um, the federal um, act regarding drugs does not provide preemption but Michigan managed to fill that hole and pass their own law. Uh, the Michigan Products Liability Statute does apply to devices, uh, and therefore we do have caps on most uh, medical device actions. Um, I say we have a crazy statute of limitations. Um, I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> it seems to be a moving target. Um, there, there is a provision in the product liability statute for accrual, which says that it's at the, uh, the discovery of a breach when someone uh, discovered or should have discovered the breach um, of, of a warranty, but when did that occur? Um, uh, there was a uh, Supreme Court case, Trentadu, that did away with common law discovery rules, uh, apparently. Um, the most bizarre case that I've seen come down recently involved uh, a striker pain pump. Uh, this is an unpublished case, Court of Appeals case. Thank God it's unpublished. But it involved a woman who had a pain pump installed in her painful shoulder in 2001. The pain pump um, was removed, I believe, in 2006 or 7. She had pain in throughout that time period. The plaintiff argued that they discovered that the pain pump uh, was defective uh, and caused uh, destruction of the cartilage of her shoulder when the surgery was performed. And Stryker said, no, she should have, knew her, she should have known that uh, she had a defective uh, pain pump in her shoulder for years before she had the surgery. And the Court of Appeals apparently agreed with that. So I think the best rule of thumb uh, for any device case, uh, when you set a statute of limitations, is from the moment that there is injury or evidence of some injury that could be associated, five minutes, <laughs> that could be associated with a, uh, an inj or, uh, a device, mark that down as the accrual date, go three years from there. That's the, mo the, the safest thing to do. I think at this point in time. Um, there's approximately uh, 11 device MDLs going on around the country, one of which is the uh, Depew um, ASR metal on metal hips. Um, that is a, a probably the hottest one going right now. Uh, just 
three minutes. All right, some, some quick, <laughs> okay, some real quick background. I think in the old days, the old days of hip replacements, uh, the liners were either ceramic or polyurethane, uh, but they wore out quickly. And, and so I think uh, the manufacturers of hip implants wanted to expand uh, their audience, and so they came up with metal-on-metal -metal hips that they thought would last longer and would appeal to a younger audience. And they also wanted more mobility in their implants, and so they created a hip with a shallower cup than the cups of the uh, implants that had polyurethane or ceramic linings. And so in 2003, they started uh, marketing a, uh, a hip that they called the ASR, and there was also a hip um, uh, resurfacing. I don't have time to go into the difference. Um, but uh, a number of overseas registries started to assemble some very troubling data, which showed that 12 to 15 percent of the uh, Depew ASR XL hips were failing and required revisions. Um, the injuries that are associated with them are loosening pain, pseudotumors uh, around the hip itself, tissue necrosis due to metallosis, uh, due to high elevations of cobalt and chromium. Um, so what, what happens here, by the way, there was a voluntary recall in 2010, but the defect is this. Because of the shallowness of the cup, there is increased edge wear on the cup by the ball. This is causing metal debris to be deposited in the tissues around the hip, and this these metal ions get into the bloodstream and they cause elevations of cobalt and chromium in the blood. Nobody knows at this point in time what the consequences of those elevations are going to be. There's investigations as to whether this is going to cause renal impairment or uh, cardiac impairment, neurologic impairment. All we know is that these ions in the blood are not good, and that's being investigated. In the meantime, we do know that the metal debris causes tissue necrosis, loosening, and a necessity to revise the hip. Um, so an MDL was formed in the fall of 2010. Uh, we've got an excellent judge, uh, Judge Katz in Toledo, who has handled uh, several uh, drug uh, MDLs. Um, there was uh, a leadership committee that has been appointed, uh, short forms for uh, uh, filing these cases directly in the Northern District of Ohio have been developed and are available. Hopefully there will be a global settlement at some point in time. If not, the cases will be remanded to their courts. Um, it's very important that the hips that are revised and taken out be preserved according to the protocol that has been issued by the court. Um, okay, I was going to talk to you about Zimmer knees, but I'm not going to um, <laughs> because I got to leave. But this is another area of hot litigation. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, oh, that's our Zimmer, first Zimmer case that we filed. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is that my impressions of this mass tort practice. Um, I don't know if any of you have read uh, King of Torts, but Grisham has a view that a lot of the mass tort lawyers uh, are, are sharks who don't have much regard for their clients or what they're doing. They're just interested in fees. Um, and uh, from my view, that, that view has some some currency, but there are a lot, of, a lot of reputable fish, I think, in the fish tank as well, who are very concerned about uh, companies uh, marketing defective products, putting product, uh, putting profits over safety, and a lot of that is going on. This is very high stakes litigation. Sometimes the science doesn't pan out. The breast implant, lit breast implant litigation is uh, a great example of uh, a case where people thought they were going to make millions and millions, um, but it turned out that the science didn't develop along the lines the plaintiffs had hoped it would. That is, uh, no studies were able to demonstrate a close correlation between DuPont's silicone and the development of conditions like fibromyalgia. Um, I can tell you that the there's a, you, you're well aware of all the advertising that goes on to get these medical device cases. There's a lot of major advertisers out there. 
um, you should know that uh, Zimmer has fought back and they filed a lawsuit against five major advertisers and law firms for defamation and libel. <coughs> and this suit is now pending in Indiana. It was just filed. And the claim is that these advertisers are misrepresenting the facts. And the advertisement that they're talking about is there was um, one advertiser actually uh, uh, from Texas, a couple from Texas, uh, a couple kind of close by. And they claimed that all of the Zimmer Next Gen knees were subject to a 9% failure rate and a 36% complication rate. And it was based upon a study that was presented to the American College of uh, Orthopedic Surgeons in 2010. The problem is that study involved a very, very small subset of next-gen knees. It only involved the next-gen CR flex. It was a very small study. It involved 100 um, uh, explants. Um, and the doctor in that case made the statement that, well, I'll just read it and then I'll close. Uh, it says, uh, this component is still commercially available but should not be used for any patient Furthermore, this report highlights the need for clinical studies prior to new design implementation. What he's saying is this 510K process is fraught with pitfalls and dangers, and this is one of them. And maybe uh, the FDA should rethink this whole process. And Richard's standing up, and I gotta go. The last good news is the FDA two days ago issued a directive to all metal on metal manufacturers and ask them to do post-market studies as to the effect of metal on metal uh, shedding and metal debris on patients and the integrity of the implants. And so what we may have is a situation akin to the Delcon Shield days with respect to metal on metal implants. Thank you very much. I've got to go.